اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما In our last session we left off on verse number 190 of Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ so in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the Muslims permission to defend themselves against those who fight them. So this was in the beginning when jihad was first permitted for the Muslims, only defensive jihad was allowed at first. So if they start fighting you, if the disbelievers start fighting you, then you can fight back. If they start killing you, then you can kill them. But only if they start it first. This was in the beginning of the legislation of jihad. Later on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gave permission for offensive jihad as well. But in the beginning, it was only defensive jihad. So this verse was revealed regarding defensive jihad. And fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against those who fight you. And do not transgress. Transgression can take many forms. Even in war, even in battle, a person may go beyond the limits that he's allowed to go to. For example, if someone is fighting a war, you fight only against the combatants. You fight only against the people who are actually participating in the war. You do not fight against women or children or non-combatants who are not involved in the fight. This is a type of transgression if someone does this. You do not destroy property you don't destroy houses of worship. You don't chop down trees for no reason. You don't do any of these type of things because this is transgression. So even in war, there are certain rules that must be followed. You fight against only the combatants. You don't fight against people who are not participating in the war. You do not destroy property for no reason. These are some of the rules that must be observed even during war. وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا So do not transgress. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He does not love the transgressors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has made certain limits. He has placed certain boundaries and we're not allowed to cross those boundaries. As for those people who cross those boundaries, those people are known as الْمُعْتَدِينَ The people who transgress, the people who go past the limits. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that He does not love these people. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, continuing talking about fighting against the disbelievers, وَقْتُلُوهُمْ حَيْثُ ثَقِفْتُمُوهُمْ And kill them wherever you find them. This is talking about the people who are fighting against you. You can kill them wherever you find them because this is war. وَأَخْرِجُوهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ أَخْرَجُوكُمْ And you can expel them from their lands as they expelled you from your lands. The Muslims had to leave Mecca. Because they were forced out by the mushrikeen of the Quraysh. They were expelled from their homes because they said our Lord is Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the Muslims permission to do the same thing to the mushrikeen. That they expelled you from your homes, you can expel them from their homes as well. مِنْ حَيْثُ أَخْرَجُوكُمْ وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَشَدُّ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ And fitna, it is more severe than killing. And fitna in this verse is referring to shirk, association of partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some of the mufassireen have interpreted this ayah by saying that if you do not fight against the mushrikeen, and if you allow them to become dominant, then there is a possibility that Muslims will revert back into shirk. If the mushrikeen, if they become dominant and if the Muslims and Islam become weak, then it is possible that there may be Muslims who turn back from their religion and return back to polytheism, return back to shirk. And this would be worse than being killed. When you fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is a chance that you will be killed. There is a chance that you will be killed. So what is worse, being killed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a Muslim or reverting back to shirk after having been a Muslim? A person who leaves Islam and becomes a mushrik, even if he lives a long life, 
and then he dies naturally. Is that better? Or is it better for a person to fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be killed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and die in that way, even if he's young? What is a better end? Of course, being killed in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better than living however long a life a person lives. If, if that person leaves Islam, his life is worthless. And when he dies, he's going to be from the inhabitants of the fire. وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَشَدُّ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ That fitna, shirk, it is something that is even worse than death. It is something that is even worse than death. This is the worst calamity that can happen to a person, that he, that he becomes a mushrik. Nothing worse can happen to a person than, than leaving Islam and going to shirk. Th that is the absolute worst thing that can happen to a human being. So dying is even better than that. وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَشَدُّ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ Shirk is even more severe than death and killing. وَلَا تُقَاتِلُوهُمْ عِنْدَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ حَتَّى يُقَاتِلُوكُمْ فِيهِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives some instructions regarding fighting in Mecca. Al-Masjid al-Haram is referring to the whole city of Mecca. The whole city of Mecca is haram. It is sacred. So it is not allowed to start fighting in Mecca because that is sacred land. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تُقَاتِلُوهُمْ Do not fight against the enemy. Do not fight against the disbelievers. عند المسجد الحرام At Masjid al-Haram Meaning in Mecca. Do not fight them in Mecca. حَتَّى يُقَاتِلُوكُمْ فِيهِ Unless they start fighting you in Mecca. So if they start the fight, even if it's in Mecca, which is sacred, it's not allowed to fight in, a, in the sacred land of Mecca. But if they start fighting you in Mecca, then yes, you can fight them even in Mecca. Because they're the ones who transgressed. They're the ones who started it. So, they deserve to be recompensed in the same way. وَلَا تُقَاتِلُوهُمْ عِنْدَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ حَتَّى يُقَاتِلُوكُمْ فِيهِ فَإِنْ قَاتَلُوكُمْ فَقْتُلُوهُمْ so if they start fighting you in Al-Masjid Al-Haram, then you can go ahead and, 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 and fight with them and kill them. Because they're the ones who started it. كَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ الْكَافِرِينَ And this is the recompense for the disbelievers. If they have the nerve and they dare to start fighting in a sacred place, Al-Masjid Al-Haram, and even the mushrikeen of the Quraysh, they were not Muslims, but they did consider Mecca to be sacred. They did consider Mecca to be sacred. So even with them considering Mecca to be sacred, if they still transgress against that sacredness and start fighting you in Mecca, then you have a right to fight them even in Mecca. So even if you killed them in Mecca because they started the fight, then there is no blame on you, there is no harm on you. But you should not start that. فَإِن قَاتَلُوكُمْ فَقْتُلُوهُمْ كَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ الْكَافِرِينَ This is the recompense for the disbelievers. فَإِن انْتَهَوْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ But if they stop, if they desist, if they stop fighting you, if they accept Islam, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Then surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most forgiving and the most merciful. And whatever they did in the past, it will be wiped out and it will be forgiven. So even if they killed Muslims in the past, while they were kuffar, even if they killed Muslims, even if they transgressed against the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they then stop doing that and they repent and they become Muslims, whatever they did in the past will be wiped out. And there are so many examples of companions of the Prophet wasallam who previously fought against the Muslims before they accepted Islam. For example, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. He fought against the Muslims on the day of Uhud. And because of his war tactics, that is what caused many Muslims to die in the battle of Uhud. Under the leadership of Khalid ibn al-Walid, who, who was one of the commanders on the side of the mushrikeen. He was not the leader, he was not the complete leader of the battle, but he was the leader of one of the factions, one of the groups in that battle. And his group is the one who infiltrated the Muslim ranks during the confusion when those archers left the hill that the Prophet ﷺ told them not to leave it was Khalid ibn al-Walid who noticed this mistake and he took his troop and he infiltrated and after that many many Muslims died right so 
Khalid ibn Walid before he was a Muslim, this is what he did. But then he accepted Islam. So is that going to count against him what he did before he was a Muslim? No, absolutely not. That is all forgiven. That is all wiped clean. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنِ انْتَهَوْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ الرحيم. So if they cease and they desist, they stop doing these things, if they accept Islam, then surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most forgiving, the most merciful. فَإِنِ انْتَهَوْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ الرحيم. وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةً وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ لِلَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, he says, and fight against them until there is no more fitna, until you have obliterated shirk. And this is the whole purpose of jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To obliterate polytheism, to obliterate kufr and shirk, and so that the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reigns supreme. I'la kalimatillah. Making the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most high above everything and demolishing every false ideology and false belief. This is the purpose of jihad. وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةً So keep fighting against them until there is no more fitna, until, there is, until, until shirk is debased and humiliated, until shirk does not have a stronghold anymore, until the mushrikeen do not have any power anymore. So you fight until you destroy shirk. وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةً وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ لِلَّهِ And continue to fight until... The religion is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the people are Muslims, until Islam is dominant over all other religions. You fight until you reach this goal. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa deen al haqqi li yudhhirahu ala deen kulli walaw kariha al mushrikun. That it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent his messenger with guidance and the true religion, al deen al haqq, this is Islam. Deen al haqq. The religion of the truth, this is Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with deen al-haqq liyudhhirahu ala deen kulli so that it will be dominant over all other religions. Walau kariha al-mushrikun Even if the mushrikun, even if the polytheists hate this, it doesn't matter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةً وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ لِلَّهِ Fight against them until there is no more fitna, until, until shirk is debased and humiliated. And until the religion is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dominant religion is Al-Islam. So if the people, if the enemies, if they stop fighting you, if they accept Islam, Alhamdulillah, you accept that from them. If they accept Islam, then they are your brothers. If they accept Islam, if they come turn back to the truth like many of the Sahaba did. They were previously on the side of the enemies and then they accepted Islam. This happened to a lot of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. In this case, now they're with you. They're your brothers and whatever in the past is, is forgiven. And in the, at this point, فَلَا عُدْوَانَ إِلَّا عَلَى الظَّالِمِينَ There will be no hostility except towards الظَّالِمِينَ Except towards the people who continue to be evil. As for those who were evil before, but then they became good, there is no, there's no hostility towards them. Your hearts are clean towards those people. There's no hatred towards those people anymore. They're just your brothers. It's as if they never did anything bad in the first place, once they accepted Islam. But as for the people who remain upon evil, and disbelief and disobedience, then yes, there will continue to be hostility towards them. فَلَا عُدْوَانَ إِلَّا عَلَى الظَّالِمِينَ There is no hostility except upon the ظَالِمِينَ Except upon the evildoers. So see the fairness and the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like no matter what these people may have done in the past, even if they slaughtered Muslims, once they accept Islam, alhamdulillah, there is no udwan on them anymore. There is no hostility towards them anymore. This is from the forgiveness and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الشَّهْرُ الْحَرَامُ بِالشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامُ وَالْحُرُمَاتُ قِصَاسِ The sacred month is for the sacred month. الشَّهْرُ الْحَرَامُ بِالشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامُ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made certain places sacred and He has also made certain times sacred. So Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Mecca, it is a sacred place. And because of its sacredness, it is, a not, it is not allowed to start fighting and start war in Mecca. 
Now there are some times that are also sacred. Al-Ashhurul Hurum, the four sacred months. We are in one of them now. The month of Muharram is a sacred month. The month of Rajab is a sacred month. The month of Dhul Qa'da is a sacred month. The month of Dhul Hijjah, it is a sacred month. These are the four sacred months. Three come consecutively. Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah and Muharram. And one is separate. That is the month of Rajab. So these months that are sacred, it is not permissible to start fighting, to start a war in these months. So just like it's not permissible to start a war in a place that is sacred like Mecca, it is also not permissible to start a war in a time that is sacred. And that is applying to these four months, the four sacred months, Al-Ashhurul Hurum. But if the disbelievers, if the enemies start fighting you in those months, then you can fight them in those months. Then they have lost their right to peace during those months. If they start fighting you, then you can fight back. If they start fighting you and then you fight them back and you kill them, then it's okay. You cannot start fighting in those months, but you can defensively fight if they start fighting you during these months. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving this permission to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the Muslims. That, yeah, we don't start fighting during these months, but if they start fighting you during the sacred months, then you have a right to fight against them as a defense. And there's no sin on you if you... If you kill them during the sacred months because they started the fight, there is no sin upon you. Ashahrul Haram will be Shahril Haram. The holy month for the holy month. The sacred month for the sacred month. Another interpretation that some of the Mufassirin have given regarding this statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ashahrul Haramu bi Shahril Haram. It is regarding the Umrah al Qada, the Umrah, the makeup Umrah of the Prophet. The Prophet وسلم, in the sixth year of the Hijrah, he had a dream that he is making Umrah in the Haram. So he told his companions about this dream and a number of companions, they wore Ihram and they went to Mecca, not with the intention to fight the Quraysh, but with the intention just to peacefully make Umrah and come back to Medina. This was when, this was before the Fath of Mecca. This was when the Kuffar of the Quraysh still had control of Mecca. So the Prophet he wanted to go and make Umrah, that's it. This is the sixth year of the Hijrah. So he wears his Ihram, the companions wear Ihram, and they go in peace towards Mecca. They reach Hudaybiyyah, Al Hudaybiyyah, right outside the borders of Mecca. And the Kuffar of the Quraysh do not allow them to enter Mecca. And they make a whole agreement with the Prophet ﷺ with certain conditions, and that is known as Sulh Al Hudaybiyyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah. And amongst those conditions was that the Muslims will not be allowed to make Umrah this year. You have to go back to Medina. So they're almost there. They're literally at the border of Mecca. And they're told, no, you have to go back. And you're allowed to come back next year. You can come back and make Umrah next year. You're allowed to stay in Mecca for three days. Then you have to go back. So the Prophet ﷺ agreed to this. So they did not go to Mecca. They did not make Umrah that year. They had to go back to Medina. Then the next year they came back and they made their Umrah, alhamdulillah. That Umrah was known as Umratul Qada, the makeup Umrah. So when the Prophet ﷺ had initially planned to go to Mecca, when he was stopped at Hudaybiyyah and they didn't allow him to, they didn't allow him to come into Mecca, that was the month of Dhul Qa'da. That was the month of Dhul Qa'da in the sixth year of the Hijrah. And then when the Prophet ﷺ came back the next year and he actually made Umrah, that was also in the month of Dhul Qa'da in the seventh year of Hijrah. So it was basically, it was almost exactly one year later by the month. Hudaybiyyah was Dhul Qa'da of the year six. The Umrah that they actually finally made was Dhul Qa'da in the year seven of the Hijrah. So some of the, of the Mufassirin have said that this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ash-shahrul haram bi shahril haram, it is referring to this. That you try to make Umrah in Ash-shahrul haram, but you were not able to. But then the next year when you did make Umrah, it was in Ash-shahrul haram. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you Umrah in Dhul Qa'da of the next year in place of the Umrah that you had planned to do in Dhul Qa'da of the previous year. Ash-shahrul haram bi shahril haram. وَالْحُرُمَاتُ قِصَاص And as for the sacred things, the law of retribution applies to anything that is sacred. So if the kuffar 
if they fight you in a sacred place like Mecca, then you have the right to pay them retribution, meaning by fighting them back. You have the right to defend yourselves against them. If they do something to you, then you can give retribution in a similar way. If they fight you, you fight them. If it's, a, if it's a sacred place that they fight you in, then you can fight them back. If it's a sacred time, like a, like a, a sacred month, like Muharram or Dhul Qa'dah, and if they start fighting you during that time, you have the right to retribution. You can fight them during the holy time. Any type of transgression that they do against something that is sacred, you have a right to repay them with something similar. So for example, the life of a human being is sacred. So if one of the kuffar kills a Muslim, then you have a right to, then, then it is the right of that person that qisas should be, retribution should be taken upon that person. Of course, it's not vigilante justice. It doesn't mean that you go and kill that person yourself. No, it has to go through the legal channels and the authorities, the government is the one who carries that sentence out, right? But you have a right to demand qisas. You have a right to demand retribution. A life for a life. Life is sacred. But if the enemy takes something that is sacred, then he loses that sacredness to his life. And it can be taken. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ فِيهَا أَنَّ النَّفْسَ بِالنَّفْسِ وَالْعَيْنَ بِالْعَيْنِ وَالْأَنْفَ بِالْأَنْفِ وَالْأُذُنَ بِالْأُذُنِ وَالسِّنَّ بِالسِّنِ وَالْجُرُوحَ قِصَاصِ an eye for an eye, a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a nose for a nose, an ear for an ear, a tooth for a tooth. Right? So if the enemy poked out the eye of a Muslim, then the retribution for that, the punishment for that is that person's eye should be poked out. If he broke off the nose of a Muslim, then the retribution is that enemy's nose should be broken off. If he cut off the ear of a Muslim, then the retribution is that person's ear should be cut off. These are all sacred things. Your body parts, it's sacred. It's in, it cannot be violated. But if somebody violates it, then they lose their sacredness to their parts as well. And it's permissible for the authorities to give them the retribution that they deserve. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَشَهْرُ الْحَرَامُ بِالشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامُ وَالْحُرُمَاتُ قِصَاصِ So all of these things that are sacred, if they violate the sacredness of someone else, then they lose their right to the sacredness for their own things. And the retribution will apply. وَالْحُرُمَاتُ قِصَاصِ فَمَنِ اعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ فَاعْتَدُوا عَلَيْهِ بِمِثْلِ مَا اعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ so for those who transgress against you, then you have a right to take revenge upon them in a way that is similar to what they did to you. But you cannot transgress more than that. For example, if somebody poked out the eye of another person, then he has the right to take revenge, you know, through the authorities, of course, in a similar fashion. The retribution for an eye is another eye. An eye for an eye. But what if someone's eye got poked out and he demands retribution that that person who, who, who poked my eye, both of his eyes should be poked out and his nose should be cut off and both of his ears should be cut off and his hands should also be cut off. This, this is not an, an equivalent punishment here. So this is a type of transgression going beyond the limits. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you permission. An eye for an eye. But you can't go more than that. This is transgression. So even in revenge, there are certain limits that must be kept, that not, must not be crossed. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنِ اعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ فَاعْتَدُوا عَلَيْهِ بِمِثْلِ مَا اعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ So whoever transgresses against you, then you can take revenge upon that person, but only to an extent to what he did to you. Only to an equivalent level of what he did to you. Not more than that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He ends this verse by saying, وَاتَّقُوا Allah And fear Allah. Beware of Allah. Because a lot of times when someone does something bad to you and you want to get revenge, many times because of our nafs, we want to go overboard in revenge. If someone did something bad to us, okay, we have a right to, to take revenge to a certain extent in a way equivalent to what was done to us. But sometimes we're so angry, so upset that when we take revenge, we do something much worse to that person than what he did 
to us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us at the end of this verse, وَاتَّقُوا Don't, you know, keep your duty towards Allah and make sure that you don't transgress. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a right to take retribution, take that retribution, but only up to the extent that you're allowed and do not go past that. Fear Allah, remember Allah. And don't transgress against His limits. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الْمُتَّقِينَ so beware of Allah, keep your duty towards Allah and know that surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those people who keep their duty towards Him. If you have Allah, if you have taqwa of Allah, then Allah is with you. So if you make sure you don't transgress against the limits of Allah, that you fear Allah and you keep your duty towards Allah, then Allah will help you, Allah will be with you, Allah will take care of you. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us all amongst the muttaqeen whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with. Inshallah, we will stop there for today, bi idhnillah, and next week, inshallah, we will continue with the tafsir of Surah Al Baqarah, bi idhnillah. Barakallahu fikum, wa Allahu alam, wa sallallahu wa sallam, wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.